I am going to discuss GEM, my unified field theory for gravity and electromagnetism. I'm going to focus on a specific technical problem, that is seeing spin 2 symmetry in a, the vectoring coupling term. I'm going to spend most of my time explaining the unified field theory because I think the logic is very simple and direct. I will then go through a calculation that Feynman does that indicates a technical issue with that sort of approach and that has to do with the spin of the coupling term. So I build this theory on the most successful field theory in all of physics and that would be the one for electromagnetism. This is the action for EM. What is an action? It is all the ways that energy can be exchanged in a unit of volume. What we do is we calculate the energy per unit volume and then integrate that over space and time. We do this integral either in flat or curved space-time. It doesn't matter. The factor of the square root of the determinant of the metric allows it to work in either place. There are three types of terms involved here. The first is an inertial term, which is the rho over gamma. Then we have a coupling term of the j and the a. And finally, we have the anti-symmetric field strength tensor contraction. That's the place where the yeah, spin one photon lives. Now, what do you do with an action? Well, one of the things you can do is you can vary the action with respect to the four uh, velocity. When you do that, you get the Lorentz force. And in a non-relativistic situation, you get Coulomb's EM force law. If instead you do a variation with respect to the four potential, then you get the Maxwell field equations, specifically the force equations, one of which, which is Gauss's EM field equation. Now, if you want to build a theory about gravity that is an extension of this one, what would you do? Well, gravity is always attractive, so why don't we add some things in? Specifically, we will add in a new current uh, coupling term with a positive sign, and we will add in a new symmetric field strength tensor. Because it's symmetric, it should be a place where a spin 2 particle could live. All right, now what are we going to do with this action? We're going to do exactly as we did before. We're going to vary the four velocity in order to get a Lorentz force. And so we'll get the Coulomb's EM force, and we will get Newton's gravitational force law out of this sort of approach. We now understand why the like charges repel for EM but a track for the Newton's gravitational force law, it has to do with the difference in the signs of the coupling term. Now if we do a variation with respect to the four potential, we will get two field equations out of this. We will get EM, uh, we'll get Gauss's EM field equation, and we'll get Newton's gravitational field approach, and once again, we'll have like charges attract for gravity and repel for EM due to the difference in the sign of the coupling term. As I was developing this sort of approach, I made a few mistakes, and I thought it'd be instructive to go over those. Well, I made mistakes almost everywhere. <laughs> for example, I was afraid to actually even come up with an action I thought it would be too difficult to do. Fortunately, it's just a variation of one of the most successful actions out there. I, it then took me a while to handle the idea of working in curved space-time. 
This actually involves two different parts. The first one being the square root of that determinant of the metric. That, and the reason that's important is because a volume in curved space-time is going to be a different than a volume in flat space-time and you absolutely must have that there for this action to make sense in both places. And then it was hard to, for me to really understand the, the covariant derivative. That's a regular derivative um, plus this additional factor which takes into account how the metric changes. Because sometimes the way something changes could be due to either the potential changing or the metric changing or some kind of combination of both. And it took me a while to really understand that. When I first wrote this down, I actually wrote down the coupling term with a minus sign just like it was for EM and had to be told in no uncertain terms that was not a good thing to do. But what I want to discuss today is the coupling term and more specifically the spin of that coupling term. Here's the logic of the criticism. For a spin one par particle, like charges repel. And if we do a calculation that's done in Feynman's lecture on gravity, uh, chapter 3, he shows that in the vector coupling term, that has spin 1. Therefore, this action cannot work for gravity because like charges repel, and that is very clearly not the case for gravity. So what we're going to do is we are going to do that calculation in detail. Now it's a little bit difficult, but this is physics, so we have to expect that. So we're going to look at the symmetry of the coupling term. We start with that coupling term. We take the Fourier transform of the potential, so the potential now becomes a current. We move along the z-axis only to make things easier. We expand that. We write out our charge conservation law so that we can eliminate the current along the z-axis. The result of all this work is we will totally understand what the coupling term is. It's not that complicated. But what's kind of neat is when we go and look at the phase, which is everything but the scalar, and we can see some symmetries in that. So now we go in detail into this uh, calculation. We start with that with a coupling term, which is just the J and the A. We take the Fourier transform of the potential, which gives us this new current and a factor of 1 over K squared, and that's part of the machinery of the Fourier transformation. To make things simpler, we imagine that we're moving just along the z-axis. We now expand with this new current, and we see all these terms. Now this is the charge conservation law, and because of it we can eliminate the Jz uh, current, and we end up with this uh, term for, or expression, for the coupling term. If we are in the reference frame of the two charges, then all we get are, is this rho, rho prime, and it's just, you know, the product of the two charges, the charge densities. If we are moving relative to the charges, then we get this sort of relativistic correction. Now, what, where are we going to see the phase? Well, the phase comes by looking, by multiplying the two um, currents together and keeping every term that results. So we can see when we do this, and we're basically using i's, j's, and k's for the uh, jx, jy, and jz, we see the first line is the, the coupling term that we had calculated in, in part 6. And then we've got three other sorts of currents. And what sort of symmetry do they have? 
Well, if j is almost equal to j prime, what we're kind of looking for are factors of two or a half in here that would um, that might like speed up how things go ar around a, a circle. But there, it, these things don't add up. They don't help each other out, and so it's going to take two pi um, to return the phase to where it started, and therefore the coupling uses a spin one photon. And this is the stuff of EM. So that's a very logical, consistent calculation. But it has an assumption in there. And the assumption is how should this, these two currents orient relative to each other? Remember, it was a contraction with a potential, and we did a Fourier transform. Well, it could be at a slight, we could rotate one of these currents relative to the other, and maybe that's what's going on. You don't know. So let's just rotate one of these currents relative to the other and see what happens. Okay, what happens when you do that sort of thing is, well, some minus signs just move around. And if we now look at the phase, phases here, Let's look in particular at this bottom one. We can see that if j is almost equal to j prime, then these two are going to be helping each other. It's going to be basically a two row j sort of thing. And it's only going to take pi uh, radians to get back, because then that, that will be two pi. And so um, we can see this is coupling term is using a spin two sort of symmetry. Now those who are very you know, sharp will notice that the x term actually has the spin one uh, symmetry. It's, that one will take 2 pi to get around. And although I don't completely understand it, it may be, uh, have to do with the fact that gravity it couples to everything and its brother. Uh, actually, it's called universal coupling. And the fact that both these symmetries live within the phase might be related to that, but I can't be absolutely sure of that particular technical detail. So what I want to finish with is just this slide that has the action. Because what I want you to do is to be able to look at it and see the different aspects that are going on. First of all, we're dealing with an action, which is every way that energy can be uh, exchanged within a unit volume, and you integrate over that volume. This will work in curved or flat space-time. If we do a variation with respect to the four velocity, we should be able to get out Coulomb's force law from that top line, as well as Newton's force law. If we do a variation with respect to the potential, we should be able to get out Maxwell's field equations, one of which is Gauss's field equation, and we should be able to get out the field equation approach for gravity. And finally, if we think about that current density term, we can see how n normally people do this Fourier transform and look at the phase of multiplying the two currents together and see spin one symmetry, therefore like charges uh, uh, repel from each other. But we know that we, if we just imagine that the two currents happen to be at a different orientation to each other, then we can also have like uh, spin two symmetry where like charges attract. And so the theory makes sense to do both the work of gravity, like charges attracting, and EM where like charges repel. Thank you very much.